The premise of this series is when our vulnerability collides with the truth of the gospel, then we experience community the way God intended. Each week has built on the last. Week one, we did the stand up, sit down thing where we realized I'm not alone. Last week, we dug into that phrase from scripture, the truth will set you free. And we learned that Jesus teaches a no secrets kind of life leads to true freedom in him. Today, we're gonna put those things together and see how it leads us to true community. Before we get to our main scripture today, I wanna jump back to last week when we mentioned John chapter five. Remember in John chapter five, it talks about the pool of Bethesda. There was the blind and the lame and the paralyzed all sitting around this one pool day after day, hoping for a miracle. There was one guy in particular who'd been paralyzed and had been there 38 years waiting for something to change in his life. Jesus heals that man, it's a really cool story. Here's my question. Why doesn't Jesus heal everybody? He healed one, what about everybody else? Why didn't he heal them? Here's a deep, theologically accurate answer. We don't know. We don't know why Jesus doesn't heal them. What I do know is that's similar to what he does today. I've been a Christian a long time now. I've rubbed shoulders with, it may be in the thousands, at minimum it's hundreds of addicts in my life by this time. And twice I've heard this story that goes like this. They say, I was deeply addicted, throes of addiction. I met Jesus. Jesus set me free from that addiction that day and I never wanted my drug of choice ever again. For one guy it was alcohol, for another it was heroin. Heard that story two times. Hundreds of other times, the story goes like this. I was in the throes of addiction. I met Jesus. I want my drug of choice, if anything, more badly than ever, but Jesus is in the fight with me now, so I'm not alone. And their story is the story of Paul in the New Testament. God, I've got the sword in the flesh. Please take it away. God says, no, I'm all you need. You got grace, you're good. So when we sing the healers in the room, which if you don't know, our team did this really cool thing for this series. They knew our upcoming series was on community. They said, let's write a song just for this series. It's available on all your different platforms now for you to listen to at home. And when we sing the healers in the room, we're not saying Jesus guaranteed he'll fix my problem. He can and he may. In fact, I'm praying for a dear friend of mine right now whose only chance is if Jesus heals him miraculously. But when we sing that song, we're saying the healer's in the room, meaning most important, he's with us and he's inside of us. And the most important miracle is not whether or not my friend gets healed from his terminal illness. It's that he will go to heaven regardless of what happens with his physical body. So he will experience eternal healing, whatever happens in the short term. So because the healer's in the room, we're not alone, but we need to add something else to that to make us not alone, and that's the church. If you flip to page one of the Bible, God's creating the universe. As he creates everything, he calls it good. When he creates man and woman, he calls it very good. But when you flip the page to Genesis chapter two, you see something that's not Good, Genesis 2, 18, it is not good for man to be alone. One of my friends pointed out the original problem in the garden wasn't sin, it was loneliness. And you don't need me to rehash the stats you've heard about how we're more connected than ever, but more isolated than ever. Recently read a story from Francis Chan's book, Forgotten God, where he said several years ago in the church he pastored, there was a guy who'd been involved in a local gang, but he had come to Christ, he had gotten saved, he was plugged in their church, he was serving, giving, and, uh, groups, all the things, but then he just kind of dropped off the face of the earth. Somebody from the church reached out to him and said, hey, just want to check on you, I haven't seen you around in a few weeks. And he said, you know, I guess church just isn't for people like me. The person on the phone said, no, ch church's for People like everybody, like what, what's going on? He said, well, you know, I used to be part of a gang and in the gang, we said we, we were family with each other. But then I got saved and I came to church and I heard you all say that church was supposed to be family, but I experienced more family in my gang than I ever did in your church. And he didn't come back. So here's my question for the culmination of this series. Is it possible that the church is the answer to the deep longing you have in your soul to be connected? Think about this. I don't need church. You don't need church to hear a sermon. 
I listened to a couple good sermons on YouTube this week. You don't need church to worship. You got Spotify, you can go to a Christian concert. I need church for two things. One is to be part of a mission that's bigger than me. And two is to be connected because it's not good to be alone. In fact, the word church, if you parse it down, means community. It means assembly. It means coming together. We've got to figure out how to do this. How do we experience community the way God designed it?